before we stare into the twisted mirror, some exciting news. I was honored to be a guest on True Crime Campfire. The episode covers some true horror with two mind-boggling cases. So please go and give it a listen. Not only are Whitney and Katie great hosts with an almost encyclopedic knowledge of true crime, they are truly great folks and deserve all the success they are having with their podcast. I'd like to take a moment to brag that I've known them since before they became podcast stars, and it has been fantastic to watch their hard work pay off. I had my own personal mini horror story with every possible technical aspect of the recording going wrong, and I couldn't have asked for more patient hosts as I ran around hysterically looking for a pair of headphones. Now, this episode is part one of two. My goal is to have part two up by next week, but I don't want to make promises because I am a slow editor and I want to make sure to always get you the best work. But I'm going to work hard to not keep you waiting as long as two weeks. While I have your attention, please rate and review the show. It means a lot to me and helps the podcast grow so I can continue to devote more time to it as I write, record, and edit each episode. As always, content warnings are in the show notes. I also have a new website up for the show. It's twistedmirrorpodcast.com, and you can listen to episodes on the site, and also the links to my socials are there for IG and Facebook. And now, on to the ones we love. You are now staring into the twisted mirror. One of the greatest gifts we can receive as a human being is to love and to be loved. Love is safety. Love is security. Love is joy. Love brings new life into the world. Sometimes, love is pain, but we will willingly sacrifice for it. Love makes all difficulties we endure in life bearable. A hug from someone you love can make a terrible day melt away. Some might argue that the meaning of life itself is love. So what happens when the thing that makes life worth living, the very emotion that makes the world go round, what happens if it becomes dangerous? I hated the Valentines. I don't mean that in the way that you hate a neighbor who plays shitty music a little too loud for comfort or asks too many nosy questions while retrieving the mail. I had the unfortunate luck of moving right next door to the man who would become my mortal enemy. There are people in this world you simply cannot communicate with, no matter how hard you try. Even early on, when we were friendly, it was like we were speaking two different languages to each other. He'd always call me PJ instead of DJ. He'd ask me about my insurance job when I fucking told him I worked at a bank. He'd ask about my daughters when he knew he had to have known I only had one boy. He'd make passive-aggressive comments about how he built the shed in his backyard and how men don't use their hands anymore when I clearly had a construction team working on my new backyard deck. Our conversations were jagged, uneven. I'd start a sentence and he'd interject with something off-topic when I hadn't even finished. Then I'd try to bring it back around, and he'd ask an unrelated question while I was still talking. 
There'd be strange pauses and then too much all at once. We were like two blindfolded dancers trying to waltz. And that's when we got along. It really started to go downhill when he came over to my 4th of July barbecue. A family affair, I might add. Got shit-faced. Started yelling about child molesters in the government. And Alex Jones said this or that. I had to ask him to leave, and shortly after that, his dog started shitting in my yard. I kindly asked him to watch Old Faithful, and either because we simply could not seem to ever quite understand each other, or because he was a massive piece of shit, Fido kept shitting in my yard. So began a year and a half long battle over property lines, noise complaints, floodlights shining into bedrooms, and trash being tossed into yards. I knew he was goading me. But the constant challenge to my manhood? The way he reminded me of the bullies who used to go after me when I was a kid? I just couldn't allow his aggression to go unanswered. The feud became all-consuming for about a year and a half. I could have put the house up for sale much earlier, but the rage was addictive. The righteous anger stole my focus from the smaller pleasures in life right in front of me. I had considered purchasing a gun for my own safety. So loud and red-faced the fights right along the driveway that defined the property line had become. Me, a man without so much as a parking ticket, suddenly found myself familiar with the local police who would be called in by neighbors when the spats became too much. The wise thing to do would have been to move and rent out the house or sell it, but that would mean Greg Ballantyne won. Won what? Now, I couldn't even tell you. If there was anyone on earth who annoyed me more than Greg Ballantyne, it was his shitty twin boys. He let them run around doing whatever they wanted like two inbred princes. They were practically feral. They tore down my mailbox like two rabid pit bulls once for the sheer entertainment value. He said it was just boys horsing around. God, their screams. They would scream at the top of their lungs for the smallest inconvenience. Not once did I hear him attempt to silence his kids. One time, we had the misfortune of dining in the same TGI Fridays. In a sea of young families and spoiled kids, his children stuck out as particularly rotten fruit. They ran between tables, hitting the backs of chairs with their toys, slamming into servers, and, as usual, screaming at the top of their lungs. Despite all that, I tried to be the bigger person. When I saw little Wesson pulling my freshly bloomed marigolds, I told him to stop and tried to talk to him in an authoritative but calm tone. I tried to treat him like a person, the same way I would want someone to speak to my own son. It was like trying to talk to a little shark. Nothing was behind those empty eyes. Unsocialized little beasts. Sure, they were only kids, but it was clear they were future adult convicts. And don't even try to come at me with some explanation for their behavior. I'm certain their dad encouraged it using them as weapons against me because he knew I couldn't do much of anything to him. The crazy thing is, I like kids. I always have. But Greg was duplicating his brand of dumb arrogance and self-centeredness through his spawn for the rest of us poor fuckers to deal with. What added enormous insult to injury was Greg's sly comments about Farron 
my son. During friendlier times, he would make comments about how my boy was soft and I needed to toughen him up. Once things got bad, it was confirmed my suspicion about his polite conversation inquiring about my daughter wasn't an honest mistake. It was an attack on me as a father and on my son for daring to be anything other than a maladaptive, destructive child. Several times, Farron had come home crying about how Wesson or Colt had gotten too physical when the neighborhood children had gathered to play. Well, I'm sorry my idea of masculinity isn't narrowly defined by brute force. For Christ's sake, he named his dumb-as-rock sons after guns. My son was raised with manners and was encouraged to express his emotions. He could carry on polite conversation with adults and not just respond with a vacant stare before scurrying off to damage some property and knock over fellow children. I remember that night Fiona gave me the ultimatum. I'd come inside from doing rounds around the house. Plants in my garden had mysteriously started dying, and I was certain it was that asshole next door poisoning them. I was in a rage, spouting off about what he had done and how I would find a way to catch him in the act. I'm sure there was some vulgarity peppered in there. Fi stood firmly in front of me, blocking my aimless pacing. Fi, that's what I called her, stood firmly in front of me, blocking my aimless pacing. And I stopped, but just kept flapping my lips. Have you heard of tree law on Reddit? I wonder if I can sue this piece of DJ. DJ! Her firm tones snapped me out of the addictive and endless bounty of wrath from which I'd come to feed myself regularly. I love you, DJ. With all my heart. But this thing, this thing between you and the neighbors, it has changed you. You're always so angry. Oh, come on, Fi. No, you need to listen. I love you because you are gentle. You are kind and sensitive. You care about people. But ever since this ridiculous feud started, you've become more and more like him. I didn't marry Greg Ballantyne. I married you, DJ. But it's starting to feel like I did. You ever have one of those moments? Or someone tells you the cold, hard truth about yourself? About something you've been blind to? It hurts like hell. It feels like a kick in the chest. But sometimes, it's exactly what you need. My behavior over the past year and a half came to me in a flash. And it was all so clear. Fiona was right. I bowed my head down, all the fire in my chest reducing to a sad ember. God, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just the things he has said about Farron, you? There it was, pulling me back into the vortex. DJ, I want to sell the house. I tried to stop her, tell her we hadn't been here long enough, that we couldn't let him win, that we had just poured a bunch of money into updates. But she stopped me, having heard it all before. If you don't, I'm going to Sonia's. I don't want our son around this. He asks me, all the time, why you're so mad at the man next door. Don't you see the example you're setting? I have never taken it out on Farron, I replied. 
It doesn't matter. He sees you. He sees everything. Those arguments frighten him. He loves you and he fears for you. Kids process so much more than what we give them credit for. If I was right, what was I becoming? I had always prided myself on being a level-headed guy. I had a beautiful family and a good job. I used to enjoy my neighbors. There were times before all this started when I had wondered what I had done to deserve the beautiful life I had. I wondered when the shoe would drop. Then I threw the damn shoe. I let myself get wrapped up in some stupid war. And I knew the reason why. Greg was a bully. And after being bullied all throughout middle school, I told myself, never again. But this vow wasn't worth it. I wasn't defeating the bully. I was becoming one. I sat next to Fi in silent contemplation after we tucked Farron into bed. I thought about the times I burst through the front door, slamming it behind me, yelling about the latest conflict. I saw it through my son's eyes. My father used to drink. He didn't take it out on me. I was lucky that way. But he did argue with my mother a lot. I remembered that feeling of insecurity. What it was like to see your father boiling with rage. It didn't feel safe. Dads are the stable ground on which you plant your feet to stand tall. When dad was shaken, when he was rumbling with rage, I felt unstable. I realized I had been doing that to my smart, compassionate, intuitive boy. He wouldn't want to worry me. He knew how much I loved him, so he wouldn't tell me about his concerns. But he worried about me to his mother. I fucking loved love that kid more than I thought my heart was capable of. More than my wife, who I loved dearly and planned on being with until the day one of us died. He was all the best parts of Fi and me rolled into one perfect little human. That moment of clarity made me realize how frivolous this whole ordeal was. I still fucking hated the Ballantines, but I wouldn't let that hatred control me any longer. Let that asshole make some other neighbor miserable. It was time to return to my family. To spend my evenings not Googling about property law or home security, but to spend it playing board games with my family or reading fair in a bedtime story. I kissed Fiona on the forehead and told her she was right. Tomorrow, I would call our real estate agent and start planning on putting the house up for sale. I saw her brown eyes glow and her chest sink with relief. It was then I saw the worry she had been carrying too. I had been such a fool to put my family through all that. Farron called for his mama. We had put him to bed hours earlier, but sometimes he woke up and called for her. I love you, she said, before planting a soft kiss on my lips and tugging flirtatiously on the bottom of my shirt. I knew she had something planned for me once Farron had settled back into bed. I smirked at her and slapped her on her ass as a send-off watching her curvy hips ascend up the staircase. A high-pitched shrieking sound wailed from the den. It was one of those emergency signals that was almost always a test. I assumed Fiona had left the TV on in there, the volume low, so I hadn't noticed. 
but that sharp alert was designed to yield anyone's attention. I peeked my head in. It was not a test. The names of nearby counties popped up on the screen. A notice to stay indoors. My curiosity now peaked. I picked up the remote and changed to a local station where I thought I'd find some news. The views on the screen shocked me. Pandemonium in what looked like a normally quiet neighborhood not too different from the one I lived in. An anchor loudly talked into her mic over the sounds of chaos. Houses smoked with small fires. Garbage littered the streets. A woman ran past her, screaming. Shortly thereafter, a man followed her with a bat overhead, ready to swing. I gasped. Another field reporter took over, this time to a slightly more urban area, clearly somewhere in L.A. There was chaos, but surprisingly, not as hysterical as the one presented on the sleepy suburban street. The Chiron read, Mass violence breaking out throughout Southern California. Reports of similar spontaneous mass violence being reported along the East Coast. I sat in front of the TV and raised the volume, glued to the unfolding events. The anchors said law enforcement could not define what started the violence. There seemed to be no cohesive link. There was no connection to political unrest of any sort. Most of the neighborhoods where the violence was erupting were low-crime areas and family neighborhoods. Not that the city was excluded. However, a pattern was emerging that most of the attacks were domestic. These weren't roving mobs looking for places to loot or strangers to attack. The attacks didn't appear to be centralized. This was mothers attacking daughters, boyfriends turning on girlfriends, sibling going after sibling. The police could not keep up with the various seemingly isolated incidents. This wasn't about crowd control. This was about managing hundreds, if not thousands, of simultaneous acts of domestic violence. What's going on? Fiona's voice and gentle touch on my shoulder made me nearly jump out of my skin. My reaction even startled her. I, I don't know, I responded, my eyes transfixed on the screen in front of me. It looks like there's riots, but it's weird. They're saying families are turning on each other. It's not a typical riot, you know, where people are gathering on the street. There's no reason. It's just random fucking chaos. Fiona grabbed a seat next to me on the sofa. Our earlier plans for makeup sex. Now set aside so we could watch the spectacle unfold. We watched for minutes, alternating between moments of stunned silence and proffering theories. I should call Sonia. Her sister lived closer to much of the action in Culver City. Up in Thousand Oaks, it felt like we were a world away. Just as she said that, the anchor who was reporting live, a vibrant, red-headed woman I had noticed before because, frankly, she was pretty hot, seemed distracted from her reporting. Whatever it was then caught her focused attention. She tried to resume her words but continued to look off screen as if something was amiss. Finally, she apologized. Excuse me, she said to the camera. Brad? Brad, what are you doing here? Brad was off camera. But my heart skipped. Something was wrong. Fiona and I glanced over at each other in confusion. Brad? The anchor asked. This time, her voice shook. I registered the concern in her voice, but before I could make sense of it, an arm raised within the frame of the camera. No, Brad, no! 
He swung something long at her, and it wasn't until the second swing I realized it was a baseball bat. The camera fell, and only a sliver of the action remained in the shot. Feet ran over to where she was, and though we couldn't see much, it sounded like the crew was wrestling the man away. Her hand fell into frame, and the microphone she was holding slowly rolled out of her hand. A trail of blood slowly oozed into the frame. Fiona screamed and clasped her hands over her mouth in horror. Oh, shit! I yelled, half raising up from my seat. Fiona hushed me, reminding me Farron was asleep. The screen cut back to the desk anchors, visibly confused and shaken by what they had just witnessed. A commercial break followed almost immediately. What the hell is going on, DJ? Fiona asked, her eyes welling up. Something wasn't right. Well, no shit. We had just witnessed a live murder. I was certain. But I mean, in a greater sense. This hall felt connected. The reports were the violence was domestic. She obviously knew Brad. Was he her fiancé? Brother? Husband? I changed to a cable news network and saw the bedlam was far more widespread than the local news either knew or had been letting on. Clips were coming from all over the country. Though the pockets of violence were scattered and seemingly random, other than the fact that they were predominantly in residential neighborhoods. There was still no explanation. Talking heads attempted to speculate, but their words were fluff. It was clear no one had any idea what was unfolding. Stay indoors was the only advice that could be offered. But it seemed people were running through the streets for a reason. They weren't safe in their own homes. I'm calling Sonia, Fiona declared abruptly this time, still visibly rattled by what she had just seen. I didn't have anyone to call. My parents were dead and I was an only child. Any other relative was too distant for me to care enough to check up on. Fiona's close-knit family had taken me in like one of their own. So, I stood back silently listening to her end of the conversation. Her sister had been in bed and Fiona had woken her up. Sonia didn't have kids. It was just her and Mike, her husband. The conversation seemed calm, but Fiona's facial expression belied her tone. It sounded like she had several reassurances from Sonia before hanging up. Is everything okay? I asked. I'm not sure. I don't know. I think something is off. What do you mean, off? She didn't sound like herself, Fiona replied. You had just woken her up, hadn't you? So she says. But she's a night owl. That woman is usually up until at least one in the morning. And there was... Fiona shook her head. What? What is it? I asked. I didn't hear Mike. And when I asked about him, it's like she was avoiding the subject. It, it was just so quiet. Usually, he's always nosing around in the background. It was dead silent. Maybe he's asleep too. Fiona looked at me sideways. I should know better than to question her instincts. I just... I feel like... I want to go check in on her. She's close to all that stuff on TV. Tonight? I exclaimed. Yes. 
I'm telling you, DJ. I know my sister. Something isn't right. Don't you see the news? We aren't supposed to leave, let alone go down there into that insanity. I have to make sure she's okay, Fiona replied. You saw what just happened to that reporter. What if something is in the water? I don't know. Mike would never hurt her, Fi. You know that. We don't know or understand what we saw. Even people in the news have no idea. DJ, I am not going to be okay until I have eyes on her. I'll stay in the car. She walked towards the front door where her cardigan hung off a hook and reached for it. Stop, I ordered, in an uncharacteristically authoritative tone. It was enough to pause her in her tracks. There is no way in hell I am letting you go down there alone. And if we both go, we have to bring Farron. Do you want to bring him into that? Fiona thought for a moment and gently pulled her hand away from the sweater. I'm worried about her, she said, her eyes turning down softly. They were sisters, but they were also best friends. Fiona's family was the kind that actually enjoyed spending time together often going on vacations together, checking in almost daily over the phone. They always looked out for each other. If it was Fi down there, I would want someone to check on her. I'll go, okay? But I want you and Farron to stay here. Lock up everything. Set on the alarm. I need you both safe. You are both my world. Her face was veiled with worry. Please stay safe and call me as soon as you can get there. If you feel you are in any danger, turn right around, run. Anything to get back home, okay? She kissed me passionately. This was a hell of a night to reignite things. I made her promise she would stay inside and not leave no matter what happened. Her cell phone rang. Her eyes went wide, but her expression quickly deflated. It's not her, she mouthed, nodding an okay for me to leave. Mom, yes, yes, we spoke, were the last words I heard as the door closed behind me. The canyon roads were desolate. That much I expected. But as I pulled onto a main road, there was a silence that was unusual, even for that time of night. It was tense, as if something was just on the verge of bursting. I gripped the steering wheel tightly as my stomach abruptly sank. Up until that point, and despite the hysteria on the news, I wasn't particularly frightened or worried. I had seen riots break out in L.A. and other parts of the country before. I had always been at a safe distance, watching from the comfort of my conveniently distant suburban abode. This was no different. My neighborhood was asleep. My sister had spoken to her sister, and she was fine. But the images on television were unlike anything I had seen. These weren't race riots relegated to destitute inner-city neighborhoods. The things people like me could shake their heads at in pity and then turn away from. I saw pristine lawns being used as battlegrounds for people who seemingly had no reason to rebel at all, let alone against the ones closest to them. Something was different and I wasn't sure what. It didn't take me long as I pulled off a main artery and closer to the grid of streets with tightly placed single-story homes that I saw it with my own eyes. Police lights flashed, blocking certain streets, 
an attempt to streamline traffic and maybe protect its inhabitants from exterior violence. I wasn't sure. Unlike the silence I experienced minutes ago, the neighborhood was alive. Far too alive for 12.30 a.m. Windows still glowed with light. People wrestled and ran while others tried to break up the violence. Random shouts and screams emerged from the dark sky. Overwhelmed police shouted and pointed. I parked blocks from the blockade and decided going on foot was the best way to enter my sister-in-law's blocked street. As I walked up towards the police vehicle, a helicopter whirred above and a bright light whizzed just past me. The officer guarding the block was half standing out of his vehicle, talking into his car radio. He rolled his eyes when he spied me and pulled his face away from the handset. Sir, you need to turn around. This block is closed off. A woman's sharp scream caught both of our attentions. But my sister-in-law lives here. I have to make sure she's okay. Call her then. You need to go back. Now. The sounds of dull footsteps hurried from out of my periphery. And then she was there. The woman running between the cop and I, in her house slippers, her arms up in the air. Please, was all she could get out, as if she was too frightened to slow down and ask for help. Behind her came a man in a white undershirt and boxers. But, hey, the cop shouted. I didn't notice the hammer in the crazed man's hand until he tackled the woman to the ground and slammed it in the back of her head with an inhuman thud. By that time, the cop had radioed for help, but he was on his own. Freeze, he shouted. The man pulled the hammer out of her skull as callously as a lumberjack would yank an axe from a tree trunk. At that moment, it clicked that I had seen that man before. I hadn't recognized him at first because of the bad lighting, and frankly, I wasn't used to seeing him in his underwear. But the red and blue flashes of light from the police car intermittently shined on his face so that it finally clicked. He lived across the street from Sonia and Mike, I had seen him tending to his lawn once or twice. They were an older couple, in their fifties. Sonia mentioned they kept to themselves. The man had an imposing stature at what I guess was about 6'5". At his age, he was mostly belly. But he still towered in a way that informed me that he was not the type of person who had ever known what it was like to have been physically intimidated by another kind of like a taller, even more psychotic Tony Soprano. She was a quiet but smiley blonde. I never saw any kids. For a moment, I thought he'd drop it. After all, he was caught dead to rights. He looked over at the cop, who again warned him to stop, gun drawn. His eyes... They were crazed and yet hollow, as if his body had been hijacked. He turned his head slowly back towards his wife, almost furtively, as the hammer quivered in his hand. He mouthed something to her. I can't be certain, but knowing what I know now, I'm almost sure it was... I love you so much. The cop shouted again for him to drop the hammer. It seemed in that moment that he might. But with an abrupt quickness that betrayed his moment of pause, he slammed it back down into the skull of his gurgling wife. Several shots rang. He raised the hammer up again. And perhaps because of his size, he didn't collapse immediately. 
at least not for a few strained, lingering seconds. Then, like a deflated tube dancer, his body sunk to the ground. Another officer came running and began a heated verbal exchange with the presiding officer. My presence was forgotten as they ran over to the body. I gazed down the block. The little beige house where my sister-in-law lived was within sight. I took a few hesitant steps back and away from the killings I had just witnessed. And when I was sure the cop had forgotten me, I ran between the two houses so I could sneak my way down the block. My phone chimed with a text from Phi. Are you there? Is everything all right? I answered honestly, but with as little detail as possible so as not to worry her. Just got here. I'm fine. I'll let you know. She stopped answering calls or texts, Fiona responded. I rested my back against the back of a white little Spanish house, stealing myself to get back on the path to Sonia's. When a loud crash came from the house, I leapt away from it, terrified, wondering if someone was coming for me. But then shouting began, and it was clear whatever was going on in there had nothing to do with me. I scanned down the row of yards, and just then, about two houses down, a back door flung open, and two young men streamed out and began scuffling. A woman screamed in the distance from somewhere out of sight. I couldn't stop to help. If the police couldn't handle it, what could I do? Besides, I had to make sure Sonia was okay, above all. As the song of sirens and bedlam played in the air, I felt my first sincere pang of worry for Sonia. I had gone to check on her just to keep Fiona happy, but seeing a quiet neighborhood like this become a civil war zone? I hoped Sonia hadn't met the same fate as her neighbor. Seeing it all with my own eyes, the rumors on TV were true. It seemed the most dangerous place to be was at home with one's family. Was there a secret cult or group that had inserted itself into every household? Plotting a coordinated attack? It seemed unlikely. Impossible, even. The look in these people's eyes. It's like something deep inside of them had been hijacked. To be honest, I was growing scared shitless. And my priority was to find Sonia. The whys and hows of it all were for people with much bigger brains than me. After one deep breath, I sprinted across the backyards. And despite the sea of violence around me, I remained focused on my destination. What I quickly noticed is everyone attacking had a specific target, and anyone else was of no consequence. The screams of heartache and betrayal conveyed a sadness and brutality much different than the typical sounds of violence one might come to expect from a riot. I made it to the yard of the two friends, brothers, cousins, who had spilled out from a back door just a minute ago. A sickening yell emerged, and I had to look over, despite having told myself to keep my eyes ahead to avoid distraction. I audibly gasped at the sight of the one pinned to the ground, as his mouth glimmered bright red. Blood squirted from the neck of the young man above, and the one beneath took it as an opportunity to roll on top and dive in, viciously chewing on him like a ravenous wolf. A girl watching 
no more than 16 or 17, released a shrill scream that made me nearly sick with despair. The guy on top clasped his throat to stop the bleeding, but thick, dark fluid drained between the seams of his fingers. He collapsed, and the girl screamed again. I stood frozen in my spot. I know we all think we'd know what to do when faced with something like this. But I didn't know what we were dealing with. Was it contagious? I had Fiona and Farron to protect. The guy on the ground stood up and spit out what looked like a chunk of flesh. What did you do? The girl cried. Why, Jason? Why did you do that? He turned to face her, his body heaving, glowing blood dripping down his hands and neck. I love you so, so much, he said. I knew at that moment she was next. What came out of me was purely instinct, as there was no time to consider options. Run! I shouted. The girl looked over at me, squinting. My presence had been unnoticed the entire time, but in that moment she took to try and place me, Jason lunged towards her. Listen. I'm not a hero. I don't want to make it sound like I am. I'm not a big guy. I don't think of myself as tough. But something happened. I started chasing him down, reaching him just as he pounced on the girl. He punched her once. And with the darkness and all the blood already on his hands, I couldn't tell what damage she had taken and what was just transferred from the previous carnage. We had become a violent sandwich with Jason in the middle. But for her to have any chance, I had to get him off of her. He raised his fist up to hit her again and I locked up his arm in mine. She coughed and I rolled him off of her putting myself on my back and him on top of me. I managed to lock the other arm. Run! I shouted in a booming voice that was new to me. She staggered to her feet. The cops are two blocks down. Run to them and don't look back. Like a boxer trying to beat a 10 count, she came to her feet, stumbling up to a handrail on the deck stairs. Then she stumbled again. I could feel her giving everything she had, but her body and mind connection had been severed by the brutal punch she had taken. I can't hold him much longer, you gotta run! She jogged a few paces, falling to her knees, then pushed herself up again, staggering in a straighter line this time. Jason didn't try to take his rage out on me. Yes, he struggled. But his focus was singular. He wanted that girl. She was all that mattered. The girl finally disappeared into the darkness. And I was growing exhausted holding down this rabid young man. I knew if I let him go, he'd be on her in seconds. I had to neutralize him. On a complete whim, I let go of one of his arms and slid my arm over his neck, keeping my legs wrapped around his waist. With the crook of my elbow secured over his throat, I squeezed, locking the arm in place with my other arm. He flailed and bucked but I had him. 
and I wish I could tell you I had been training for this for years. But I'm not that guy. I think his focused rage kept enough attention off of me to pull it off. As soon as he went limp, I released him, hoping I hadn't killed the guy. I rolled him off of me and went on all fours panting and shaking from the adrenaline. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I whimpered, wiping the blood off my arms onto my shirt. My legs quaked as I willed myself up off the ground. Jason started to stir from his brief lapse of consciousness. He rolled over and locked eyes with me as they opened sharply, and he gasped for air. She, uh, she, she went that way, I said, pointing in the opposite direction from where she ran, hoping that whatever was happening also made people into idiots. I turned away and sprinted. Well, I tried. It was more like a drunken jog, purposely letting my focus dull to the world so that I couldn't view the sharp details of the mayhem around me. I couldn't afford to stop like that for another family. Finally, I reached Sonia's house, pounding on the door frantically, fearing Fiona was right about her hunch. Sonia and Mike were kind, level-headed people, I assured myself. Surely they wouldn't devolve into the savages that were running and screaming and wrestling along this normally quiet street. When there was no answer, I ran to the front where I knew they had a key. I skidded along the grass of their front lawn when a dark figure caught my attention. It was her neighbor. Old Bob, they called him. Not to his face. Old Bob was a widower. A loner. A grump. His kids detested him, and Sonia and Mike would snicker that if you said hello to him, if he didn't flat out ignore you, he'd at best offer a low grunt. From what they could gather, he spent much of his days tinkering around his garage with CB radios and whatnot. They had never seen a visitor come to his home other than the one time one of his adult children stopped by and an argument ensued. They joked he probably had bodies in the basement. Today, though, he stood on his lawn, silently, a shotgun in hand. I froze, fearing that the gun might be used on me. At that time of night, I was sure I looked like an intruder. I put my hands up, though he hadn't yet acknowledged me. I'm here to check on my sister-in-law. He looked me up and down, eyeing the blood on my clothes. That, that was from, I, I just saved a girl in that house over there. I, I swear, I'm fine. He nodded. I'm not worried. You don't have that look in your eye. But you probably shouldn't go in there if you care enough to be looking for him. Do you know what's happening? He gestured to his garage, the door open. It was full of radios and disassembled gadgets. They're saying people are turning on those closest to them. The government doesn't want to tell people. The news doesn't either. But there's a pattern. I don't know if you think you want to help them now, but the rage kicks in without warning, and then you're blind to the world. All you want to do is go after someone. And it's mothers going after sons, wives after husbands, siblings killing each other. All I'm saying is it sounds crazy, but I've watched decent people tear each other apart all night. He pointed at Sonia and Mike's house. And I can tell you, I haven't heard a peep from in there since I stepped out here. They might be asleep, I offered. He shrugged. You think it's some conspiracy? How can people just turn on each other like that? Is it a disease? 
I came from Thousand Oaks and it's fine there. Why here? Why in Culver City and Long Beach, but not Eagle Rock or wherever the hell else is in total chaos? Why not yet, you mean? And I don't know the whys. I only know the whats. You just walked through this neighborhood of maniacs and no one even looked at you, right? Well, same here. I don't have family and I don't much care for neighbors and I'm sure it's mutual. It's like I don't even exist tonight. I don't think that's a coincidence. I huffed in frustration. Well, well, I'm going in. He shrugged again. Sue yourself. But I'm not going in there to save you if things turn sour. I'm guarding my property, and that's it. I wouldn't expect anything more, I snapped. How ironic that the most sullen, antisocial man in the neighborhood seemed utterly immune to the violence. Surely, if there was a free-for-all, he'd be one of the top targets on the block. But as I surveyed the neighborhood one last time before turning towards the house, it was as if his home was covered in an invisible shield. There was so much movement, so much hysteria, and yet his home and Sonia's place were quiet, unaffected enclaves. I strode up the porch steps and knocked on the front door once more before jamming the key into the keyhole. The release of the lock signaled a finality, a commitment to something I could no longer turn away from. <laughs>